with $85 million and taking this guy. This is not a project. To me, if you get Drake May or J.J. McCarthy, understand it. Let him be around Cousins, who's a little sensitive and clearly is not happy because his agent came out right away. And you get – Michael Penix is not some sit-on-the-bench guy for two years. I mean, I'm not saying – who knows if he's going to be good or not. No one ever knows. The, but he's a plug-and-play quarterback. He's been starting for 17 years in college. He's ready to go. So, to me, it's a waste of the allocated resources because the most powerful thing, the Vikings are going to get this, the, the Broncos are going to get this, all the teams that draft the court, is the contract, right? Because you then can sign 50, 80 million dollar players when they're available. They're giving that to another quarterback, and that's the one position really in sports beside the kicker. You know, in basketball, you rotate guys in. Defensive line, you rotate guys in. Baseball, you can switch guys. Quarterback, one guy plays. So to me, it's a waste of resources, even if you're like totally understand doubling down on the quarterback. And the Aaron Rodgers comp with Jordan Love is stupid because Jordan Love, a lot like even way worse than J.J. McCarthy or Drake May, major, major project, Mm -hmm. right? So, And that was at the end of the first round. The other thing is Michael Penix has the eighth overall pick, unlike getting a guy in the late 20s, is pretty expensive. So he's immediately one of the highest paid backups in the NFL, and I – I don't always agree with Chris Sims, but he had a pretty good point. During OTAs, it's not like Kirk Cousins is going to be out there. Well, who's going to be taking the reps? Penix. What, what, is, what is the Atlanta Falcons full of? Young, impressionable players. They're going to be like, damn. And the one thing Belichick, you, you can crush him on certain things, was always a lead at locker room dynamics. It's already weird. And, you know, I see people like trade Cousins. He's got a no trade clause. They're, they're giving him $62 million of actual cash in like a six-month period. And we know the way these cap work, you kind of mess with the cap. But they are pretty obligated on the dead cap for a couple years to keep him around. So it's just it, – it felt like a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants move when you would have known probably early on in the process, January, early February, definitely the combine, like we're going to have a pretty good chance to draft this guy. Why not? Okay, Sam Darnold's getting ten million dollar offer for Vikings. Why not give him fourteen million dollars one year? Right? You could have manipulated a little bit, and maybe they got pressure from the owner. But let's face it, that interaction last night was pretty bizarre. And again, I'm a Michael Penix guy, John. But it, it is. It's a little bizarre. We're we're you're talking about the squandering of draft equity yesterday. I wanted to ask you a, a question about a guy that never does. Your old friend, a guy you used to work for, Howie Roseman. We we talked about him yesterday a lot, and then in the lead into uh, round two, the opening bell today, about the the philosophy and the ethos of Howie Roseman and the strategy, which I'm hoping you can give the audience a little bit more context for because of your experience in the Eagles building, working there. The way that I see it from the outside looking in. I was comparing him earlier to uh, recalling Ozzy Newsome, the way he used to do it for the Ravens, where you don't get myopic and and zero in on positions in rounds. Like, we have to take this position or this position because they're our biggest needs. But that those two decision makers, it was, we're going to stay wide open, our eyes wide open on the board because we're picking later on. And we know that the NFL guys always fall down. And we're willing to take the value, whoever that is. So we're going to keep our options open and just accept the steal that falls down to us this year, that being Quinion Mitchell. But but give us, is that, do you think that that is a fair way to describe how, how, how he does it? And give us some idea into the process there in the Eagles building. I would say, obviously, he's become, over the last half decade, I mean, if not the best, I mean, one of the best. And his ability to understand value, I mean, he had to just be la- laughing, right, at the... <laughs> At, at what the Falcons did because the value proposition of the draft, what you pay, what you use your equity on, what you pay your players is a huge point of emphasis in that building. The other thing is I, I was actually a little shocked. Remember when they took Jalen Rager and the, you, and Zimmer and Spielman went nuts and that was a cool moment. And then Je- Jefferson went next. They made a conscious effort the next year and really up till now to go big schools. Right. And they've really just, kind of pillaged two big schools, Georgia and Alabama. It's why I uh, honestly was a little shocked. I, I think clearly they think this guy's better than the Bama corners, but they, they have leaned the big schools. And they just said, if we're going to make a mistakes, we're not going to go with a smaller school guy because they learned from it right there. They had 
Justin Jefferson sitting there from LSU, no one knew he was going to be this good. But it was, looking back, like, what were we doing? This guy was just on one of the most prolific offenses. And I think that they they must have really, really – I haven't even spoke to anyone in the building today, but they really, really valued this player because it had – that's a conversation. Like, they know the Bama guys, you know, every day in practice, let alone their competition on a weekly basis, you feel a lot better. It's why I like Brock Bauer so much. Not just what you've seen on film, but for two years, you know, 21 and 22. Imagine the guys he's going up against every day in practice. You know, iron sharpens iron, right? You guys do podcasts all the time. You get better and better the more and more you do. So they valued this player. They, I'm sure, like, the reports were dead right that he was sniffing around moving up and got a little lucky, let's face it, in the sense that six quarterbacks went – I mean, almost went in the top ten, right, <laughs> basically – and then the, the three wide receivers also in the top nine. So that just shoves all these defensive players down. And the other thing is, historically, pass rushers and high-end corners just don't make it past 15. And it really didn't start till 15 with the pass rushers. So very unique. So I, I just don't know if we're ever going to see anything like this unless football now is just quarterbacks and wide receivers, which honestly might be part of it. But it's it's wild. I mean, I, he'd be the first to tell you we got a little lucky that we didn't have to move and get the number one corner on the board. Like, that's that's unheard of, isn't it? It is. Uh, defensive tackle off the board for the Washington Commanders. Newton from Illinois is, oh, there he is. on 6-1 and 304. So your guy, Thor, steel. is now a Washington Commander. You say steal. Tell everybody why. Well, he's just so active. And in this interior defensive line class, you had Murphy. And then after that, you fall down like to Dutton. He was he was a number two guy on my board. And then there was another little drop, at least for me, on my board. Newton was the guy, though, heading into the season who was like number one with a bullet. Uh, and and like the, the fact of him falling down here, I'm a little bit surprised. He is a little bit on the smaller side, but most of these three technique guys are. The reason that I went with Murphy over him that I was more bullish on that was Murphy, I see more two-way utility with him. I like the way that Murphy gets the the, the pass uh, rushing uh, penetration without selling out his run game gap responsibilities. Like he'll, he keeps the gap integrity and he will just occupy the dude. So like him and Sweat, like the, the linebackers could just zip around and whatnot. Whereas uh, Johnny Newton is one of those guys who is the riverboat gambler shooting the gaps. He's a fun player to watch because he will get the penetration very, very quickly. But when it's a running concept and he's doing that stuff, sometimes the the uh, offensive linemen are they like it because he he goes the wrong way and they can just really easily get him out of there because of what he's done. But uh, the 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 you're getting him to get after the quarterback from very close to the ball and and that interior penetration can blow plays up really quick. Well, uh, speaking of blowing up things, looks like the Patriots are going to blow up another draft. This is just <laughs> like a few years ago, Andrew Erickson, that you and I sat on this very show. Uh, we were waiting for a selection for a wide receiver, and we got Tyquan Thornton. Instead, now we're going to get the wide receiver 19 on Thor's board, Jalen Polk oh, from Washington. Uh, 122's Thor evaluation overall. Pick number 37, <laughs> boys and girls. Uh, it you is could have had Lad McConkey, and you you trade down three spots Thor, and take Jalen Polk. We know we could have had Lad McConkey. You don't have to say it out loud over and over again, but uh, I know Andrew Erickson. You're going to say it over and over again for uh, a very long time. Erickson, um, your thoughts and feelings about this selection here. All right, so I'll stay, we'll stick with the positives first. It is a wide receiver, so so that's good. Number one, <laughs> draft the wide receiver. We are setting the bar very low here this evening. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, look, he's. My 13th ranked receiver overall, so there are plenty of guys I would have ranked and taken over him here. Uh, the two things to point out, though, he fits systematically to what they already had. Like, he can be an X. They needed an X receiver. They don't need more slot receivers. So I think that he can fill into that type of role. And the one of the Washington coaches that was with Polk last year as part of that offense now works for the Patriots. So... I'm assuming that that coach probably had some influence on this particular pick here, and that's why they went with it. I, All right, I, John, you were oh, yeah. on the stage here too because John. Uh, I don't think I he can play he... on the boundary. I I have to say uh, before okay. you, you go over, I I think no, Polk is good. a slot only, and I I don't think he can we'll, get down. We'll the get to either, your take too, Thor. We'll get to your all, take also. I, I want to get John in here. You're here all night. John's in and out here. He's a busy man. So John, uh, give me your take on this selection here. Uh, if you're talking about taking guys potentially uh, out of order, 
this has got to be like a, a Christmas morning for you here. Maybe he was a top 10 guy on Jonathan Kraft's board because we know Jonathan Kraft now is the pseudo GM of the Patriots. So, yeah, I, I, listen, I, I've shorted the Patriots organization hard uh, just moving forward for the foreseeable future. I'm a, I like Drake May. I just think it's a situation that is going to be very, very difficult. I mean, a coach who's been coaching for under five years, you know, he, this guy rose up the ranks really fast. And the negativity surrounding that organization with a quarterback. Here's the thing. When you draft a guy like Drake May and your team's bad, no one's going to want to watch 17 games of, of Jacoby Brissett. So he's going to get thrown in way sooner than he should. And it could be really, really difficult. Now, I, I, I'm a Pac-12 guy. I, I think Polk's a solid player, but I'm with you. Elliot Wolf, born and raised in the Green Bay system, where they're typically a little more height, weight, speed. And right when I looked up, you know, he's, it's not like – He's some blazer. He ran like a low four five. He's not the he's six one, two hundred pounds. But yeah, I mean, I listen. I I'm just I'm out on the Patriots. There's not many players that they could have taken that would have made me feel really good unless somehow they got Caleb Williams. Uh, and I'm a like you know for 20 years I'm a Fresno State guy. We had a lot of guys on that team play for. I, I've rooted for the Patriots. I'm a Belichick guy. But I, I think it's going to be a rough couple years. I, I think it's going to be really, really ugly. And it, this is a hard situation for these developmental quarterbacks to get thrown into. I mean, look at Thor's guy gets to just ease in in, in Minnesota, right? Mm-hmm. Same, e- even Bo Nix, his head coach, might be a little crazy, but is also the play <laughs> caller and has a ton of experience, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you look at Brock Purdy having Kyle, whoever plays for Sean. It's such an easier landing spot. You have this head coach who's a defensive guy, young guy, a lot of moving parts. He's not, he has nothing to do with the offense. So they're, they're really tied to Van Pelt, who probably got a raw deal. Deshaun wanted him out or whatever, but because I thought he did a pretty good job with uh, Joe Flacco. But, but well, still, John, I, I think it's going to be their personnel. Their personnel stinks. John, the question, I guess, is this. And, and this is something that, you know, I think Patriot fans have been frustrated with the last few years of the Belichick regime, and now it seems to be carrying over. We thought it might be different this year. They didn't trade back. They took the third pick, which was Drake May, the quarterback. So, so far, so good. But here we're in another situation where you could have had this guy at, was it 68 that they pick again, right, theoretically? You probably, you might have been able to wait and get him there if you liked him and taken something else here. Isn't that the point here where the teams in the NFL like the Philadelphia Eagles and the Baltimore Ravens who continue to crush life every single year in these drafts who don't necessarily have high picks every year they do the same thing, which is they take the talent on the board where it's appropriate and then they still stash those guys that they like those prospects that they think are going to pop and they get them too. Why can't other teams follow along this same suit? And why is it teams like the Patriots specifically that continue to think they are smarter than everybody else in the room? Well, I think a lot of teams, and I don't, you know, Jonathan Kraft clearly has his hands all over this. Their coaches get really involved. And the one thing coaches do not care at all about is value. I want this player and I want him now. I want this player and I want him now. And I I, I think when that happens, I think that's where you see a lot of these picks. You know, once you get past the third round, who cares, right? But in the top, like you said, top 75 picks, getting a guy – Drafting a guy at 45 when you could have had him at 70 is pretty devastating. When you could have had two players instead of one with that same right. guy. And I think, the, I think the coaches have a very, very strong arm. It's one thing with the quarterback. Honestly, I thought with the Patriots, and people might have thought I was nuts, I thought they sh- – and, and I understand the owner wouldn't want to do this – kind of punted on this year, trade back, accumulate a ton of picks, and just draft sweet players. But who's to say – if they had made the Drake May trade, let's say with the Giants, gone from three to six, added some second and third round picks or whatever, that they would have not just taken these players anyway. So it might have been a moot point, right? More picks doesn't make you better with some organizations. Just ask the Carolina no, no. Panthers. <laughs> just ask the Panthers how that works. And that's what a general manager is for. The discipline to say, hey, coach, yeah, you love that guy. Don't worry. We have a plan for that. Thor, you've been so patient, which I know is not your MO. So let's no, get to you not. and your take on Polk there. I just want to make sure. See, this is the thing. Thor doesn't have a lot of people up to his cabin in the woods. I'm much more of an Italian host. I like to have everybody over for big Sunday dinner. So you got to give the other people, some new folks, some time to chat here. So give us, we have the Titan selection coming up in just a moment here. Thor, give us your take on Polk here. 
uh, what went wrong. <laughs> yeah, with uh, two Patriots homers in here, let me give you the hospitality that I show in Minnesota. What a reach. What an egregious reach by the New England Patriots. <laughs> Jalen Polk is a mirage that was created by uh, Jalen McMillan's September injury last year. It, it very much like uh, Jalen Hyatt the year before when Cedric Tillman went down in September. Let me give you guys some stats. In the 20 games the last two years where Jalen McMillan and Jalen Polk were on the same field together, healthy and active, and played the entire game together. Jalen McMillan, 124 catches for 1,657 yards, 14 touchdowns. Jalen Polk, 68 catches, 1,210 yards, 9 touchdowns. Every time Jalen McMillan was healthy playing the whole game, he was Washington's uh, second option behind Roma Dunze, Jalen Polk was the clear wide receiver three and distant wide receiver three. When when McMillan comes back the end of last season in November from the injury that he struggled with, you know, throughout the fall last season, this was during the heart of that college football playoff run that Washington had. Of course, they end up play, uh, reaching the college football national championship against Michigan. W what do you think happened with Jalen Polk then? He went back on the milk carton where he was before. The, there was two of the games in the last uh, five or six where, where Polk plays the entire game. He's healthy, of course, play, plays a full game. He had zero catches in, in two of those games. The, again, the, the heart of the college football playoff, you know, d during that whole thing. Uh, in this awesome passing offense where Michael Penix, Terry Fontenot's boy, threw for 5,000 yards last year. And Polk had zero catches in two of those games. I don't know what you're doing there. And and the projection going forward, I, I think he's a slot. He he did play on the outside there uh, in that offense. I think he has to play slot in, in at the next level. The the explosion, the speed, stuff like that, that is not his forte. The thing that 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 he leads with, he has awesome hands. I will give him that. But I think he has to be a slot at the next level. It's just an efficiency thing. If, if I'm putting someone in the slot, I want someone that can stretch the field. That is not Jalen Polk. I, I think that's an egregious use of an early second round pick, particularly in this receiving class where you had still on the board, you had Troy Franklin, Roman Wilson, Javon Baker, Adonai Mitchell. I, I would have taken Jalen McMillan above him, his teammate, who's going to go two rounds later. Uh, for me, a mistake, especially Lad McConkey was available and you traded down three slots and then take Polk. I don't know what they're doing here. All right. Well, let's continue on here because picks are flying fast and furious. The Titans drafted Devondre Sweat Big at boy. 38. So the Panthers are now on the clock, but they are not because Big they boy. make a move with the Rams to move up to 39.